Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to level two. My name is Nathan Ronan, and in this little sample video, what I'd like to do is talk about a topic that is important for level two candidates to master, which you generally see in the item sets on the level two exam, and that is in equity, the concepts of free cash flow. And there's two concepts, free cash flow to the firm and free cash flow to the common shareholders. So you got FCFF and FCFE. Now we don't have time to go through every one of them in this limited sample, but what I would like to do is show you that it's very important for you to understand sometimes how the formulas are created so that you understand their, their background and then you can, if you had to, be able to reproduce them on the exam or check any errors that you have because you understand the formula rather than just having memorized it. That is one of the hallmarks of my teaching approach is to get you to understand the concepts and apply them to the kinds of item set questions you'd get on the exam as opposed to just showing you a bunch of bullet points and slides and PowerPoints so that you can memorize them. So it's really important for you to understand free cash flow to the firm and free cash flow to equity. But before we just get into the formulas, what we need to understand is what does free cash flow to the firm really represent? Free cash flow to the firm it can be defined as the unencumbered or unrestrained free cash or cash flows, okay? So unrestrained or unencumbered, meaning free cash or cash flows that are available to all the providers of capital. Who are all the providers of capital? Your debt holders, your preferred shareholders, and your common shareholders. Those are generally considered the three providers of capital. After what? After the firm has paid off what? all the other types of expenses that they needed to do. So in other words, this is all the cash or cash flows that's available to these providers of cap capital after the firm has paid its taxes. Because first of all, the minute a company makes money, who's the first person besides paying wages to employees, who's the first person that they have to pay? They have to pay their taxes. If you make money, you pay taxes. So they have to pay taxes. So it's after all taxes have been paid and then after all fixed capital investments and all working capital investments have been made. Why? Because when common shareholders and preferred shareholders and other providers of capital are providing capital to the firm, what do they expect the company to do? They expect the company to be able to not only repay the money that has been invested, but they also expect the company to grow. And how does a company grow? By making capital expenditures, having the most modern equipment, the most modern, most modern facilities, having the most modern fixed capital investments, and also making the necessary additions or changes to working capital. <clears throat> and then after the firm has paid its taxes, and after it's made all of its fixed capital investments and all of its working capital investments, then whatever is left over can be paid out to the providers of capital as interest and principal to the bondholders, as preferred shares to the preferred shareholders, and obviously as common shares, uh, common dividends to the common shareholders. Now, in the readings, after we understand what free cash flow to the firm really means, in the readings they present four different approaches that you do need to know all four different approaches to calculating free cash flow to the firm. Now, a lot of candidates get really fixated on this and they try to memorize the formulas. The problem is, is that you've got four formulas for free cash flow to the firm with many different components and then you have also three or four formulas for free cash flow to the common shareholders. And then when you put it on top of all the other formulas or all the other things that you're learning in the program, it's very easy to make a mistake or get confused if it's a plus or a minus. So what I'd like to show you is how you can possibly conceptualize this and recreate the formulas on your own if you ever get stuck. Now for free cash flow to the firm, they present you with three approaches that are based on the income statement and then one approach that's based on the statement of cash flows. Now, if you take a look next to me right now, I'm going to show you the first approach to calculating the free cash flows to the firm, the first income statement approach. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start all the way at the bottom of the income statement. What's the bottom of the income statement? That is called net income, net profits. And I'm going to say, you know what? All you providers of capital, debt holders, common shareholders, and preferred shareholders, all I have for you is net income. They would laugh. They'd say, come on, net income, that's all that's available to us? No way. First of all, first of all, didn't you take all of these 
deductions, all of these expenses like depreciation, amortization, depletion on the natural resources or on the equipment? Well, yeah. Well, you never paid that out. Depreciation is not, a, who'd you make a check out to for depreciation, depletion or amortization? That's cash that's still sitting there, but you deducted it to come up with net income. Well, that's available to us. So what I would need to do is if I'm going to come up with the true free cash flows to the firm, I would need to start out with net income and then anything that I deducted on the income statement as a non-cash charge would have to be added back. What are examples of non-cash charges? As I just mentioned, depreciation, amortization, depletion, also restructuring charges, for example. But the ones that they would only mention on the exam are probably like depreciation or amortization. So I would have to add them back to net income because I deduct them initially to come up with net income. So I would have to add them back because I never paid them out. And if I never paid out the depreciation, amortization or depletion or the restructuring charges, then that is cash or cash flow that's available to all the providers of capital, okay? Now, the other thing that I need to realize is that I have to consider about paying taxes to the government. But wait a second. When I look at net income, is net income after tax or is it before tax? It's after tax. So therefore I've already paid my taxes. So the IRS in the United States or whoever the taxing authorities are in your country, they have basically been paid. So net income is after tax, so I don't need to make any adjustment because I assume that the taxes have obviously been paid. So I don't need to make any further adjustment for taxes. But what I do need to make an adjustment for is any type of growth because again my providers are capital my providers of capital are expecting me to grow so i need to make fixed capital investments and working capital investments but the fixed capital investments when i make them they're going to be on the balance sheet showing up as assets and then they're going to be in the statement of cash flows if i paid for them in cash but the fixed capital investments do not appear on my income statement and what am I starting with? My net income. So what I need to realize is since the fixed capital investments that I made, meaning the additions to property, plant and equipment are not on the income statement, they're on the balance sheet as an asset or on the statement of cash flows as an outflow of cash. If I bought them, I need to make an adjustment to net income because they have to be paid before I can show anything that's available to the providers of capital. So I take my net income and I've added the, back the non-cash charges and now I'm going to deduct the fixed capital investments assuming that the fixed capital investments were paid in cash, okay? Any fixed capital investments will reduce the net income. And then I also have to consider any kind of changes to networking capital. Networking capital would be the changes in my current assets minus the changes in the current liabilities. But be careful, it's not all of my current assets and it's not all of my current liabilities. I would, I would, because I'm looking here at working capital from a cash flow perspective, not from a balance sheet perspective. What do you mean by that, Nathan? Well, when I calculate the working capital of a firm based on the balance sheet perspective, I take all the current assets and I subtract all the current liabilities. And that gives me the working capital or networking capital. That's a different computation than for cash flow from the cash flow perspective, where I consider most of the current assets and most of the current liabilities. Well, Nathan, what current assets and current liabilities don't you consider when you're calculating free cash flow to the firm? You would not consider cash. You would not consider cash equivalents. Those would be the current assets you don't consider. And on the current liabilities, you wouldn't consider notes payable, if the notes payable is a current liability, and the current portion of long-term debt due. And then as we go through the lesson, I would explain to you how each of those would be treated and why. But those are the four that you would have in your notes that say, do not take into account from my current assets, <clears throat> cash and cash equivalents, and for my current liabilities, don't include notes payable and current portion of long-term debt due in terms of coming up with the networking capital. And you'll also see that in my formula, I put this in parentheses, I put a minus, because minus, the change in networking capital in parentheses, and that is later on when we would do an example, I would show you why it's important to have those parentheses so that you don't make a mistake in terms of calculations because that's what they many times will expect you to do on the real exam. And I would go over a problem to show you that. 
And then the last component that I want to d d discuss here is the interest expense times one minus T. Why is it even there? Well, we already said, what is free cash flow to the firm? It's the unencumbered, unrestrained, meaning free, cash or cash flows that's available to all the providers of capital, meaning debt holders, preferred shareholders, and common shareholders, only after the company has paid its taxes, which it has, because we're using net income, and we add back any of those non-cash charges, and after the firm has utilized any funds that it needs for future growth and expansion, meaning fixed capital investments and working capital investments. Because fixed capital investments and working capital investments will appear on the balance sheet in terms of assets and on the statement of cash flows if they were paid for in cash. The final adjustment that we need to make to net income is to realize that, well, dividends to the preferred shareholders and dividends to the common shareholders are going to be the cash flows to them. They are actually deducted from net income, but we haven't deducted them. So we don't have to make any adjustment for dividends to the preferred shareholders or the common shareholders because we haven't deducted them from net income. But that's the cash flow from net income that goes to the common shareholders and the preferred shareholders. And that portion of net income that doesn't go to the common shareholders and the preferred shareholders is retained for future growth and expansion. But what's the whole thing with the interest expense? Interest expense that is paid to the bondholders is a cash flow to the bondholders. So because it was deducted to come up with net income, we need to add it back because we're trying to show what? All the cash flows that are available to the providers of capital. So interest expense is available to the bondholders, but we've already deducted it to come up with net income. So in order to show the free cash flows to the firm, by definition, we would have to added back. Now we add back not the whole interest expense, we add back the after tax. Think of the after tax as the net interest expense. Why? Because interest expense in the United States for the most part is tax deductible. The more interest expense you have, the greater the tax that you can deduct from your taxes. We say that interest expense is tax deductible. The more interest you have, the lower your taxable income, the less taxes you will pay. Well, if you're, not, if you're paying less taxes because you have more interest expense that you can deduct, if you're not paying more taxes, where's that money remaining? In your pockets. Well, if it's remaining in your pockets, who does that belong to? The providers of capital. So in other words, when I pay the bondholder $60 coupon, I'm going to get a kickback from the government because interest expense is tax deductible. So I might be paying $60 to the bondholder 6% on a $1,000 bond, $1,000 face value bond. I might be paying 6%, so 60 bucks a year. But then the government may be kicking back a portion of that, let's say $24 in the form of what? And then in the form of a tax deduction, meaning that interest expense is tax deductible. So net net, how much am I actually paying the bondholder? I'm paying them 60, but I'm getting a kickback from the government of 24. So effectively or on a net basis, I'm only paying out 36. 60 minus 24 would be 36. So therefore I need to take into account interest expense times one minus T, one minus the tax rate, as the net interest expense because on a net basis in my example I'm only paying out 60, I'm only paying out 36 bucks, not the full 60 bucks because I'm paying 60 to the bondholder but the US government is sort of like quote refunding me the other 24. So net net I'm only paying out 36. And, and that is how we, why we add the after tax interest expense. Again, remembering that interest expense is tax deductible. So whatever I don't pay out in taxes is remaining in my pockets and is available to all the providers of capital. And that's how we would go through this first formula on the free cash flow to the firm. And then we would continue along the way with the second form and the third form by going up the income statement to EBIT and then EBITDA. For example, if I start with EBIT, then I didn't pay my taxes. And who do I pay first? Pay taxes to the government if I have cash flows. So I would have to use what is called the after-tax EBIT, EBIT times one minus T. But again, we would continue with this in the lesson that way and we would build these formulas so that you understand and remember them better as opposed to just having them on a screen or having them as a bullet point or footnotes and just memorizing them on, a, on, a, on, a, on an index card. That's not the way you need to understand so that you can apply. So hopefully this gives you a demonstration of how I actually try to teach the level two material, understanding and applying, not memorizing, and then applying it to item sets.